All right, welcome back to the uh, second um, of our online uh, classes here from uh, 162. And uh, just so you know that we should have co closed captioning going on today, so you can uh, select that option if you like. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, remind everybody, let's uh, keep trying to type questions into the group chat for now. We'll see how that works. Um, and I will try to respond to them, and I will certainly repeat them for everyone. Um, and um, let's, let's go let's see how this works for us, okay? So if you remember from last time, uh, we were talking about uh, page tables, and this is a particular structure for a page table that I like to call the magic 10-10-12 uh, pattern for 32 bits. And if you notice here, um, what you've got is uh, 10 bits give you 1,024 uh, entries in the top level page table, 1,024 entries in the second level page table, and then pointing at four kilobyte pages. And uh, if what you can see is uh, essentially that we've got um, four byte entries, page table entries, and so this all works out. 1,024 times four gives us a 4K page. So each of these pieces are the same size as the pages, which has that rather uh, interesting effect that we can actually page out parts of the page table. Uh, the other thing is, I pointed this to uh, everyone here. Here's the 32-bit uh, uh, structure that's actually used on an x86 processor. And what you see is the uh, segment that you happen to be using comes from the instruction in one way or another. Um, and then it uh, is used to look up a um, segment selector, which it has in it a 13-bit uh, pointer to a segment plus a table ID. So this is showing you the global table. So what you do is you grab the segment ID um, and uh, whoever is uh, annotating there, please uh, stop. Uh, and then what you see is basically that segment selector selects a descriptor. That descriptor uh, becomes the base as well as uh, we add the offset to it and we get a linear address. And then that linear address is in a 10, 10, 12 bit address page table. So uh, this is exactly what's used in, uh, in modern um, architectures, uh, especially at the 32-bit level, there's a 64-bit version of this um, as well. Uh, we also started at the very end of the lecture to start talking about uh, or reminding you about caching. And uh, if you notice, one of the things I was reminding you about from 61C is this average memory access time, which uh, if you have a processor that's just talking to slow main memory at 10 nanoseconds, and then you have a processor that goes through a cache domain memory, then assuming you have any locality at all and actually are able to use the cache, then you get a much improved average memory access time. So it, without the cache, um, you're essentially gonna get 100 nanoseconds and it'd be nice to do better than that. And if you notice average memory access time, as you recall, is hit rate times hit time plus miss rate times miss time. And I pointed out that the miss time is the time to pull from the lower level into the cache and then from access and then to access from the cache. And so I gave you two possibilities here, one with a 90% and another a 99% uh, hit rate. And in the first case, that average memory access time comes out to 11.1 .1 nanoseconds, which is significantly less than 100 nanoseconds, of course. But if we have a 99% hit time, we get down to two nanoseconds, which is even smaller. So, um, it's really all about can we get things to uh, actually be in the cache, all right? And the reason we were talking about that, of course, is we're talking about this rather expensive uh, process of translating from a virtual address to a physical address. Just looking back here, I mean, you go, here's a move instruction to an address, and you have to look up in the segment descriptor table, and then, then in the um, couple of levels of page table and so on, boy, that's going to be really slow unless we can somehow cache it. And so that's kind of where we were picking up from last time. And if you remember, uh, again, this is the more extended hierarchy. The idea here is we have big things on the right and small things on the left. The big things are slow because they're big. That's a, something of physics. The uh, small things are fast, again, because of physics. But if we do caching well, we get uh, the access time to look uh, like it's got the speed of things on the left, but the size of the things on the right, and we can approximate that if we have a uh, good locality. Okay, so um, the new thing we've kind of added in all of this is the page tables are actually in memory. So they might be on disk or in main memory, um, or even in some level of the caches. And uh, we're gonna put this transition, uh, the uh, TLB 
uh, on the um, registers here or near the register speed in order to somehow get things to be faster. Uh, and that's kind of what we're uh, looking at, okay? And how do we make address translation fast? Well, we basically uh, look at the process where um, the processor basically sends reads through the memory management unit that get translated, uh, sent to the cache and then down to memory. And wouldn't it be great if once we went to all the trouble of translating these translations where we have a virtual page becomes a physical page, wouldn't it be great if when we pull something out of the page table in physical memory, we cache it somehow near the MMU and so then the next time we look for it, it's fast. All right. Okay. So that's our goal for today. And uh, were there any questions on uh, what we covered last time? I wanted to pause for a second. Please use the group chat if anybody had something to, uh, to ask. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about now is we're gonna talk, uh, remind you a bit about how caches uh, could be structured. And we're gonna try to figure out how to actually structure this particular um, type of cache called the translate uh, the uh, TLB translation look aside buffer and so let's remind a little bit we this was the very end of the lecture so the TLB itself is a cache of translations uh, and if a translation is already present in the TLB then you grab the physical address without ever touching the page table and so this is how we're going to hope to avoid going all the way down to DRAM uh, memory all the time when we translate uh, and you know, the idea of a TLB was actually invented by uh, Maurice Wilkes prior to caches, uh, amusingly enough. And so people decided that if it's good for page tables, why not for the rest of data and memory? And as a result, a cache was born. Um, the other thing is when you invent something, as I mentioned at the very end of the lecture last time, you're allowed to name it. So it's called a translation look aside buffer, and we'll continue to call it that. And uh, Maurice got to call it uh, that. Uh, I guess if he called it Fred, as I mentioned last time, we would talk about how Fred was speeding up our translations. Um, but the key is going to be that on a TLB miss, uh, potentially the page tables might even be in the cache. And so the access is maybe even uh, somewhat faster than going all the way down to DRAM. So whatever we come up with, we would like to uh, utilize all of our caching that's available to us. OK. so. Uh, what, how do we apply this to address translation? Here's a, another figure that would maybe help us with this. So the CPU is generating addresses that are virtual. Uh, we check and see whether they're cached in the TLB. And uh, if they are, we go directly um, to physical memory and look things up. And so the TLB effectively uh, speeds up our access so we're not going all the way down to memory for this translation. Of course, if we're unlucky, we have to go to the MMU, and then we save the result in the TLB and go forward. OK. So uh, the, uh, of course, we also talked about untranslated reads or writes that might be available to the, uh, to the kernel. Now, the question that you might want to ask yourself, since you all remember 61C very clearly, I'm sure, is, uh, is there locality in this address lookup? Because uh, if there's no locality, then there's no hope for us to get caching to work. And um, well, what about instructions? You can imagine that with loops in instructions, uh, we tend to use the same pages over and over again. And so yeah, there's definitely locality in the instruction stream. Uh, the stack has a definite locality because you're sort of pushing and popping on the stack. And so you have a tendency to use the same pages over and over again. And data accesses uh, have less page locality, but there still is some. Um, you could imagine uh, walking across gigabytes of storage if you were going through uh, a huge array and that would have no locality and you'd spend all your time uh, faulting in the TLB, but uh, many other patterns are much better on the TLB. Uh, so uh, the question here we have is uh, just to clarify, there's a possibility that if translation's not in the TLB, then the page table uh, references may be cached. Um, what, yes, so, um, the ta page table itself can be in the uh, L3, L2, L1 cache. And so it's possible that when we're walking through the page table, we're also not going all the way down to DRAM in order to satisfy that TLB request. Um, did that answer the question? Andrew. So uh, great. So let's continue. Um, and so 
Uh, just like in regular caches, we could ask ourselves if we could have a first level, second level cache hierarchy, and the answer is certainly yes, because it's a cache uh, structure just like before. So now um, moving forward, uh, what kind of a cache is the TLB? All right, so we've got, uh, if you remember, <laughs> From 61C, we've got a lot of parameters. We can say the line size, which is how big each cache entry is. We've got the set size, which is uh, what's the associativity. Um, we've got data sizes. We've got the number of sets. Uh, and so there's a lot of parameters here. And so just uh, for your uh, edification, and so we're all on the same page, let's remember a little bit about caches, OK? And then maybe that'll help us actually figure out what our organization is supposed to be. So if you remember, uh, I think they probably taught you about the three C's in uh, 61C. Um, I'm gonna actually talk to about the, uh, the four C's or the three C plus one, which I do sometimes. Um, these first three actually came from a PhD thesis from Mark Hill, uh, who was uh, here at Berkeley at the time. So once again, this is a, a Berkeley uh, artifact. Mm -hmm. And um, compulsory misses, first and foremost, are um, basically the uh, time when you access something in the cache, but you've never accessed it before. So in theory, there's really no way for the cache, uh, other than sort of predicting the future, to uh, know that you needed that in the cache. And so that's called a cold miss. And uh, you have to typically go all the way down to the next, you know, go down to the next level of the cache or all the way to DRAM to fill a compulsory miss. Uh, the one exception to this is uh, if you have a good prefetcher that's sort of recognizing a pattern in use, then it can potentially prefill the cache. Um, capacity misses are cases where the cache is just too small. Okay, and so um, you've loaded a bunch of things into the cache, and then by the time you get back to use them, the thing you put in there is gone, and the reason it's gone is the cache was just too small. All right, that's a capacity miss. And the only way to really fix capacity misses is by making the cache bigger. Uh, a slightly more subtle type of miss is called a conflict miss. And a conflict miss, um, I'm gonna remind you in a moment, but that's when the associativity of the cache is a little too small. And uh, we have multiple cache lines overlap in the same physical location. And so when we loaded it in the cache the first time, uh, we subsequently loaded something that kicked it out of the cache because of a conflict, not the cache size. And then when we went back, it's missing. Okay. Uh, and um, last, which is sort of the plus one, is what's called a coherence miss. And a coherence miss is an invalidation uh, that can show up if you have multiple cores, for instance, in a multi-core processor. Uh, that's an instance where one core might have loaded a value read-only, and uh, if nothing else happened, it would cache really well, except that another processor did a write. And as a result, to keep those two locations coherent, typically what happens is that write causes an invalidation, um, which then invalidates the first read. And so by the time the first uh, processor goes to look, uh, it has to reload in the cache. All right, do these uh, remind everybody, sound roughly familiar with what you remember? Uh, any questions on this? Now, um, one question that sometimes comes up, wasn't asked here, but is, so how do you tell the difference between a capacity and a conflict miss? Uh, and, you know, I basically gave you the description, well, a capacity miss is due to size and a conflict is uh, due to uh, lower associativity. But in fact, if you were running a simulation against the cache, how would you tell the difference? And the answer is, if you have a series of accesses and you're going to run them against the sample cache to see whether it's the right cache for you. Um, everybody needs the right cache in their life, right? Um, what you would do is you'd run it against a cache that was just like the one you're testing out but had a fully associative. Uh, fully associative. Uh, so the only reason you'd ever kick something out is because it's too small. You'd find out all, what all the misses were. Those are the capacity misses. And then you'd rerun it with your actual cache and anything new would be a conflict miss. Okay, um, so the question here is associativity the same as the amount of neighboring memory we bring in? No, um, so uh, that's a type of uh, spatial locality is what you're re uh, referring to. And uh, 
hopefully in the next few slides, we will have this straight, but if it's still not clear, uh, if you could ask that again, that would be great. Um, so let's look at what associativity is. And before we do that, I wanna understand what a cache block looks like. So a block is kind of the minimum thing we can pull into a cache, all right? So um, whenever you get a cache miss, you go to the next lower level and you pull in a block, okay? And that block uh, could be easily uh, 32 um, bytes, uh, for instance, if it was uh, you know, an early processor, it could be 128 bytes in some of the more modern ones. And in this block itself, the address that you're um, going to access is divided into a couple of pieces. So the, the lower set of bits are used to decide, excuse me, which byte within the block you're interested in. So in a 32-byte block, uh, this is going to be five bits because uh, the log uh, base two of 32 is five. It's one of those uh, things to put on your list of things to learn. Um, then the block address is kind of everything that's not the block itself. So that's the remaining, if this were five bits down here, that would be uh, the remaining 27 bits in a 32-bit processor. And um, there's some of this is called the index, which decides what set we're in. And the other is called the tag which helps us to decide whether something's in the cache or not. And I, don't worry, I'm gonna remind you what those things are. But so the index is used to look up candidates in the cache, and the tag is used to decide exactly which of those options are available. And if there aren't any uh, things that you're looking for in the cache that meet this block address, at that point you get a cache miss and you gotta to go to the next lower level. So just to put this in perspective, um, a direct map cache is a particularly simple cache, which uh, hopefully is uh, triggering uh, memories for you guys. Uh, the direct map cache has associativity one, so um, there's uh, essentially no associativity here. Uh, it's, we're going to talk about a two to the n byte cache, where the, ups, the uppermost uh, 32 minus n bits are the cache tag, and the lowest m bits are the byte select or, uh, or block size is two to the m. Uh, and so if you look, here's our, here's our cache down here in the lower right corner. And what I've got here is 32 byte caches. Okay, we computer scientists always start things at zero, right? Um, so we have 32 byte caches and each one of these lines is a different cache block. So the first one, you know, cache block zero has 32 bytes, cache block one has 32 bytes, cache block two has 32 bytes, et cetera. Um, the, each one of those cache blocks in the cache has its own tag and a valid bit. And so um, really, when we're gonna try to find out whether the thing we're looking for is cache, this is gonna be a point at which we check the tag, and if the tag matches, we will start ask, accessing our data. So here's our address, it's 32 bits, and I've divided it up, okay, into um, the byte select, which is the lower five bits. That's gonna tell us which of these bytes we want in the end. Okay, that's the lower five bits. The next five bits in this particular cache are gonna tell us which line or cache block we're interested in. Okay, and so it's five bits because we have zero to 32 or 31 here. And then the last part is the tag. Okay, and so here's what comes out of say the processor that says, hey, I wanna look this up. The first thing we do is we use the index to, to look up into our uh, static memory, static RAM, the cache block that we're interested in. And notice in this direct map cache, it's very simple. You just take the index. Uh, let's say this has got a one in it. Um, so that would be, you know, zero, 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 one. That gets us the first block. Uh, and now this is the cache block we're interested in. How do we know if it's the right block? Well, first of all, does the tag field match the tag? And also, I forget whether I have this on the animation, is the valid bit valid? So either a mismatch here or an invalid will tell us that we don't have what we want. And then assuming that the answer is yes, now we use the byte select field to pick the byte of interest. So here the, the uh, lower um, five bits are all uh, zeros. And so we want this lowest byte in the block. Okay, and so uh, this was a successful hit because we're assuming that this tag here matches to uh, 50 hex. Okay, the cache index gave us this line and the byte select then because we had a match gives us that first byte. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here now uh, and see if there are any questions on the direct map cache, because this is our simplest, and it turns out the fastest cache we can build is a direct mapped one. 
Anybody have anything that they're curious about, trying to remember why this works the way it does? Okay. Nope. Okay. Good. I'm going to assume we're good to move on. Okay. The more bytes, here's a question. The more bytes in each block means there's a higher spatial locality. Yes. So the more bytes that we have, so if instead of these being 32 bytes, these were 64 or 128 bytes, the reason that's got higher spatial locality is because when there's a miss, we pull more bytes in from DRAM, which means that um, if our byte select, uh, you know, this byte select here, when it's all zeros, gives us this uh, byte 32, when it's 001, gives us byte 33, so on. The more bytes we load at once gives us a higher spell spatial locality. So yes, that answer uh, answer your question. Uh, so that's why that's why in fact modern processors tend to have something more like 128 bytes in their caches. Uh, and then down at the um, that the lower here yeah n is five. Um, very good. That was the question. So in this case, um, the n bits for the block. Um, oh excuse me. Uh, I take that back. No, in this case, you're asking what's n. This is n is 10, okay, because the tag itself is uh, the part that we look up. Oops, sorry, back it up. So in this case, the n is 10, m is 5. That, I think, is what you wanted, Daniel, which is uh, the, the size of the um, cache block itself as defined by the fact that m is 5. Got it? Good. And notice, by the way, that the tag is the part of the address that doesn't directly access the cache. So the index is an index into the cache itself. The byte select pulls something out of a cache line. The tag is the part that we don't have. Now, what I wanted to say very uh, quickly to everybody is notice this issue here that's kind of interesting. There are a bunch of addresses for which the cache tag is um, different, but the lower 10 bits are the same. Okay, I mean, this is, after all, this is uh, 10 bits down here. So we've got 22 bits up here. There are 4 million addresses that all share the same lower 10 bytes, bits, I mean. And so as a result, all 4 million of those would try to map into the same cache line. And so if we went for a different, uh, if we went for a different address that had the same index with a one here in these five bits, we're going to kick this one out. And so if we go back to look at it again, this would be a great example in which we have a conflict miss, okay? Because we, by conflict, something that matches the lower 10 bits are going to kick this one out and we're going to have to refetch it later if we go back to it. That would be a conflict miss. So how do we uh, improve on this? We, now we have associativity. So this is getting back to that question a little bit earlier. Um, what is associativity about? So what we're gonna do here is we can potentially have an n-way set associative cache where there are n options, um, and the n options are all looked up by the same index. So I'm gonna have n equal to two. And what that means is unlike this previous one where n is one and this cache index gives us exactly one candidate block, in the case of uh, the associativity being two, um, what we see here is, uh, hold that question for just a second, Andrew. What we see here is because we have an associativity two, We've got two uh, possible get banks of caching that we can look up. And so the first thing we do is we use the um, index. So the answer is no. Not every capacity miss is a conflict miss. Um, if you look here, uh, when we have our cache index is going to pull two different uh, items and uh, two different candidate cache lines. And then we're going to check the tag with both of them. And if one of them matches, we compare, we get a bit that's high. And at that point, we select this data from that cache block. And then we can, last but not least, use our byte select to go after it. So I think the way to understand, again, the difference between capacity and conflict misses is literally if you imagine there is no possible conflict, so you start with a fully associative cache, you find out what all the misses are there, and then you, uh, pull your associativity up, and uh, that gives you your conflict misses. The one flaw with that, which is I think getting to that question, the flaw with that is that sometimes um, when you have a, an associativity cache that's smaller than fully associative, which I'll show you in a second, uh, 
sometimes misses that would have occurred in a fully associative cache end up not occurring. That's a little counterintuitive, but it does happen. Um, so hopefully that, uh, that answers your question there, Andrew. Um, so the, uh, so why is this interesting? So what's good about this is now we have two lines with the same lower bits that will um, possibly uh, hold data. And so our conflict, we'd have to conflict with two separate different lines before we kick everything out. And so it's less likely to have conflicts when you increase your associativity. And as you increase your associativity, but say keep your cache the same size, what's actually gonna happen is your um, cache index is gonna shrink uh, and you're gonna have more and more banks and together they'll add up to the same cache size as before, um, but uh, you're gonna potentially look up uh, more candidates, okay? And so you could take this direct mapped cache, pick a size here, this is 1K, okay, we could, turn that one kilobyte cache into uh, two 512 byte banks, still a one kilobyte cache, but set uh, two way set associative. And then last but not least, we could do this trick, which is there's no index because this is fully associative. And what happens here is we could compare the cache tags of everything. So every line has a tag and we find the one that matches and that, and then once we've got a match, then we, um, pick our byte out of that. And if you notice, there's no chance of any conflicts here because any, uh, any line uh, can be put in any slot here. And so there's no conflict. Now you might very, I'm sure several of you out there are thinking, well, why don't we do this uh, all the time? Why isn't it always fully associative? Can anybody uh, guess what the answer to that is? What's the story on associativity? Anybody remember from 61C? Yeah, it's slower, high overhead. Um, hit time is long, more expensive. Good, those are all good answers. Now, what's tricky about this is why is the hit time longer? Um, you, and if you look here at this fully associative cache, you might say, well, I'm doing all the comparisons in parallel, so that's fast. Why should this be uh, a slower option? And the answer is, size. This is big in transistors and so everything's further apart and so once you get a match you got to go further. Okay so physics means that this is slower and not only the physics of the size of the transistors but if you look here there's this MUX and so as we go closer and closer to fully associative this MUX has many more inputs uh, to get the right output and that's also going to be a big structure that's slow. So as we add the associativity, as it goes up, uh, things get slower. And so you got to do that trade-off. Uh, so um, the question is, what did I mean by you have to go further? What I mean is that um, if you have a circuit with a small number of transistors, it's going to be a small area. If it has a lot of transistors, it's going to be a bigger area because they just they take space. And so by bigger, that means that a, that a signal that goes from one part of the chip to a, another, when the chip is bigger, it's got to go farther in, so it just takes longer. Um, so that's a physics issue. Okay. Um, the question of why, uh, the other question is, why is the index placed in the middle as, as opposed to the upper bits up here? Um, anybody have a, a thought on that? Yeah, so this gives us a better, uh, this gives us less conflict. And the answer, that's a good answer. So the reason this is less conflict is what this means is that uh, we can have a set of things that are similar uh, addresses that are close to each other that fit in the, um, that fit in the cache. If we put stuff up here, uh, what would happen is um, that we would effectively get a direct map cache down below and for certain chunks of the memory space and it would be much slower. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think that's good. Um, notice by the way that in all of these cases that I've been giving you, the, uh, the cache line is uh, always 32 bytes and we're assuming we have a 1K total size. And so what we're doing is we're rearranging um, the cache into pieces. 
to get that to go. And uh, assuming we get to that place later in the lecture, uh, that will be interesting when we talk about ways of overlapping TLD lookup and cache access at the same time. Okay, so administrivia. I hope you all know this is very important. Saturday is pie day, and that's not, you can go out maybe and get some good banana cream pie as well, but it is uh, Saturday, March 14th is pie day. Um, and I thought I'd tell you a couple of things about pie because pie is one of my favorite numbers in, in the world. Um, one thing that's very interesting is that 40 digits of pi are sufficient to calculate the circumference of the visible universe down to atomic dimensions. <laughs> All right. Is there a good place to get pi in Berkeley? Many good places. Um, so uh, the interesting thing here is so uh, 40 digits, which I show you right here and which you should all know, you know, 3.14159265358973384663283279 for 42884191. And then of course it goes on 693993751058209749444, et cetera. Um, by the way, sorry to the closed captioner, you don't have to put that in there. Uh, but the, um, the thing that's interesting about this is that, uh, you know, even though 40 digits are way too, uh, many for any physical application. Why do we like pi? Well, the notion that it's an irrational number that goes on forever has basically been uh, has been basically an issue for every for a long time. People think, well, what's are there any patterns in it? There was even a book uh, by Carl Sagan, um, a uh, science fiction book, where if you went out far enough, there was actually a pattern of ones and zeros that made a picture in pi. But anyway. Uh, the thing I wanted to also point out is uh, the best formula for pi is uh, this very cool one from Ramanujan, where one over pi is equal to, I won't even bother, this incredible summation. And last year on Pi Day, Google uh, announced that uh, one of its employees, uh, Emma Iwao, um, Iwao, basically calculated pi to, um, amusingly enough, uh, 31 trillion 415 billion nine hundred and twenty six million five hundred and thirty five thousand eight hundred ninety seven digits so that was uh, a new record and um, anyway and yes you guys can all round uh, pi to, th to three although three point one four is pretty good so uh, some real administrivia now um, so don't forget your peer evaluations okay it's very important that you fill them out um, and uh, this is as important as getting to know your TA. And uh, I'm assuming that most of you have all done this, but we have a few stragglers, so it's very easy to do. Um, we've talked a lot about that before, but uh, make sure to do it. Um, project de two design docs were due yesterday, uh, as you may know. And uh, the thing I wanted to point out is uh, since the design reviews are an oral exam, um, they are still mandatory unless you're sick or there's a good reason for it. Um, you need to uh, try to try to make sure you go um, to your Zoom uh, call with your TA for the design reviews and make sure that you find a time you can all attend. And ideally, if you've got a, a system with a camera on it, that would be great as well because your TA wants to, it's easier for people to talk uh, in a small group. But um, so please, uh, Please plan on attending those. Those are mandatory virtually, of course. Um, and I know I saw a bunch of questions on Piazza earlier today about uh, not having the Zoom links from their TA. Um, I apologize. I think we ended up posting a bunch of them. And if you still can't get them, uh, you know, keep reaching out to your TA because they should be available soon. Uh, and so you've probably all talked with a lot of your friends and neighbors at the uh, widely varying types of midterms that people have tried over the last week. Um, <laughs> there's been a huge amount of discussion going on in the uh, on the faculty lists on how to do exams. Um, technically speaking, uh, people being in school in person is only suspended until after spring break. Um, I'm not entirely um, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen. Uh, I did say somebody say that UCLA is giving A's to everyone. Well, we'll, we'll uh, take that under advisement. Um, the, uh, 
I'm not sure what's going to happen, but you guys should all study as if the exam is happening of some form. It'll probably be uh, more likely to be virtual than not. But, um, you know, material up to lecture 18, uh, at least some material from that is certainly fair game. Um, so along these lines, uh, you should also try to go to your discussion sessions. Um, see what, uh, you know, see what is going on there because that'll help you with some of the material as well. All right, are there any questions on this? Is the exam cumulative? You know, um, that's a good question. Uh, technically, uh, everything we do is cumulative because if uh, we can't write questions that um, easily assume you uh, forgot everything from the beginning, uh, we try our hardest to focus um, directly on uh, on the material that's new, but um, we assume that you'll still know what was going on from, from the previous midterm. Um, there is a good question about any tips on meeting with project groups now that it, being in person is generally harder. I think, uh, you know, one of the things to do is to make this, um, uh, no, the final is, is um, similar uh, to what I just said for mid midterm two, so there is no, there is no final, there's only midterm one, two, and three, and those will be you know, focused primarily on the new material. So, um, but anyway, so tips on meeting with project groups. I think you should try to make your virtual meetings uh, must-see uh, TV, so to speak, and just uh, pick a time that everybody's gonna be together and just meet, it, uh, meet up. Uh, use Zoom, yes. Um, if you've got Zoom or some other, I think Google Hangouts works pretty well for small groups. Um, and everybody should have access, I believe, to Google Hangouts. Um, whatever works. I, I think this is enough of an unprecedented situation uh, for everybody pretty much everywhere on the planet right now. Um, so uh, whatever works for you guys, let's do it. And what would be great is, in fact, maybe we'll start a Piazza post or somebody could say things that work for keeping groups together uh, during virtual code, <laughs> virtual uh, classes. So um, anyway, I, I don't have anything else to suggest on that front. I think use every tool you can come up with, um, you know, and just be safe and wash your hands frequently. Uh, remember, you sing happy birthday twice. I suppose you could uh, uh, recite pi to the last digit twice uh, while you're washing your hands. That would probably be long enough as well. Um, and so that will try to stay safe and I will keep you up to date on the Piazza post as to what's new. Um, I think what's good is at least Berkeley didn't uh, give you guys five days to move out of the dorms or else like Harvard and a couple other places did. <laughs> uh, anyway, any other administrivia questions? I realize this is tough everybody. Um, let's uh, see where we're going. Uh, try to try to keep the material interesting and keep it flowing. I may, I may have to come up with some uh, interesting uh, items from the, the world of computers uh, for every lecture. Maybe I'll figure something out to try to keep the interest up. But, you know, in your group meetings, try to keep the interest up as well. Okay. Should we go on? Professor Weaver style. Sure. Okay. We will... Uh, We'll possibly do something like that. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, you wanna hear about the priority inversion bug? Yes, that sounds good. Not today, but um, we'll talk about that. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, so moving down, uh, back onto the material here. Um, in the, uh, where does the block get placed in the cache? Uh, so I wanted to just show you direct map, two-way set associative and fully associative, just to give you a kind of an idea of where things might go. So here is, um, an address space uh, with 32 blocks in the cache. And uh, what you can see is, for instance, um, or here's the address space, it's got 32 blocks in the address space itself. If your cache has only got eight and it's direct mapped, the way you decide where a block goes, for instance, block 12, is it's 12 mod eight, which is the number of cache lines, and that essentially gives you um, it gives you where it is. So basically sort of every eighth cache line is gonna be a conflict in a direct mapped cache, okay? In a two-way set associative, 
Uh, 12 mod four tells you that pretty much any, excuse me, every fourth cache line can fit in one of these two places, okay? So that's for the same eight block uh, cache. And then last but not least, with fully associative, we still have eight blocks, but any line can fit in any cache. All right, so are we good on that? All righty. So, um, and by the way, that modulus question has to do with the parts of the address on the bottom that uh, hold the, um, that hold the index and the block uh, ID. So where should a block be placed on a miss? So for direct mapped, it's very easy. There's only one possibility. But once we uh, start thinking about this, if you notice this fully associative example, um, what's interesting about this is any new cache miss has eight places it could go. So how do you decide where to put that? Uh, in the direct map case, you only have one place, so that's easy. Fully associative, not so clear. And so uh, one option is uh, basically least recently used. You say, well, pick a line that was least recently used and go with it. And that's the one you throw out. Or you could do random selection. Uh, what's interesting about, about this is you can see, for instance, that if you're doing cache access, that um, the miss rates for a workload between doing LRU and random really don't make much of a difference once the cache is big enough. If you notice the difference between these two um, options here, LRU and random, isn't really very much when you have a large cache, okay? That's because the miss rates are low and then randomly picking one, there's enough space in the cache that uh, you know, you're unlikely to get a lot of conflicts. Uh, what's interesting about this particular comparison is this depends a lot on how expensive your, uh, it, it is to miss in the cache. So your cash penalty, uh, thinking about a TLB for a moment, is the cash penalty high or low? What do you think? Okay, I, I have a, I have a uh, plea for high. And the answer is yes, because you gotta go and walk the, the um, you have to walk the page table basically when you miss in the TLB. So the TLB is starting to get kind of expensive to do uh, random replacement. And so you could imagine wanting to, in fact, do some sort of LRU for the TLB, especially since the TLBs are small. Uh, okay, and so the small TLBs, because they're in your pipeline, as you see, the smaller you get, the more advantage. There is some advantage to uh, doing things. LRU has got a slightly lower hit rate here. And so, uh, miss rate, I mean, slightly lower miss rate. And so there is some advantage to LRU. So does computing a random index incur some non-negligible time overhead for this? Now, when you're talking about the index, um, you're talking about just the index in the address. Uh, the, the, the answer is pretty much no. So randomness, uh, all you have to have is just a counter that's spinning really rapidly and you just freeze it at the moment you're doing the, uh, the replacement and you've got a random uh, number. And so there really isn't any overhead there. LRU is more interesting. And um, if you're ever curious, maybe uh, when I get my office hours going again, I can tell you how you can actually implement LRU um, in hardware. Uh, it's pretty interesting, but it gets expensive pretty quickly. So anyway, so bottom line from this is as you get bigger caches, randomly picking something to miss uh, might be okay unless your penalty is high. Um, what happens on a right, uh, is MRU ever used in industry? Uh, pretty much not. All right. So, uh, yeah, I haven't seen MRU used on caches per se. So uh, the problem with that is basically um, you're likely to reuse something. So if you have any uh, temporal locality, kicking out the most recently used thing is almost guaranteed to uh, cause a miss if you have any locality at all. Um, MRU is something you might use in more of a FIFO uh, type thing, uh, which there are some uses for that, but not necessarily for caching. So um, what do you do on a write? So there's two options. You can do write through or write back. So write through says that you write the cache item and the underlying memory. Uh, write back says that you put your data only in the cache, and it's only when you replace the block that you write it back. So giving this picture for a moment, what it means is if I have write through, um, if this item is cached and I uh, write to it, I also write to the underlying uh, DRAM right away. In write back, I, the, I put it only in the cache, 
and the memory now becomes out of date, and it's only when I replace that I write back. Okay, that's called write back. And so the issue there about, um, excuse me, whether uh, when you want to do one or the other. So the the uh, pros of write through is read misses. You never have any uh, writes, and so you can throw them out quickly. But the uh, processor is held up on writes um, unless the writes are buffered, so that can slow you down a lot. Uh, write through tends to be used in the upper levels of the cache, assuming that you don't go off the chip. Write back uh, means that repeated writes are not sent to the DRAM over and over again, but the cons are more, it's more complex. You gotta, um, might have to write the dirty data back when you, um, when you have a miss. So if you think a little bit about it, we haven't gotten to uh, how we actually use virtual memory yet to page. But you can imagine that if the uh, virtual memory is thought of as a cache on top of the disk, that we absolutely don't want to do write through <laughs> because that would mean that every write of the processor would have to go to the disk, which is going to be bad. Um, but what it does say is that when we do writes to pages in memory, it, whenever we replace a page, we have to first see if it's dirty and write it back to the disk before we get rid of it. So um, we're going to have to mention that, especially when we get into our page replacement algorithms in a little bit toward the end of the lecture and next time. OK, so any questions? There's your very quick reminder of what caches are from 61C. I'm going to assume that that uh, went well. OK, the question is, how is data consistency handled if write back is implemented in a multi-core system? That's a great question. And the answer is, there are many ways. Um, the simplest way is if you actually have a bus on the chip, then the bus can notice every time there's a write, it would notice that um, I've got a read, uh, I've got a, a similar write uh, that I've already done earlier. And that point, the, everything gets frozen and the first write goes back to memory uh, before the second write's allowed to go. Um, so that's with a bus. Uh, that doesn't scale too well. So what typically happens to give consistency uh, both for dirty data and for eliminating reads that are going to be out of date is uh, some sort of uh, directory cache coherence protocol, um, which will, uh, I think that actually I'll talk a little bit about that later in the term. Um, but there are several ways of keeping consistency, and it's basically either broadcasting what's going on so everybody can keep their stuff up to date or keeping a directory that sort of has the information of who's got dirty data and who's got uh, read-only caches that need to be invalidated. Hopefully that helps. Uh, all right, so what's the impact of caches on operating systems? Many things, okay? So as I mentioned last time, everything in an operating system pretty much is a cache. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things the operating system needs to do is deal with cache effects. So maybe uh, maintaining the correctness of various caches. Uh, for instance, one of the things that isn't typically invalidated automatically, like I mentioned previously for caches just a moment ago, is the TLB. And so if you change the page table, um, then oftentimes you've got to go hunt down the TLBs that might have uh, incorrectly cached a value, and you've got to invalidate them. Um, and um, that's called TLB consistency, and that's often handled in software. Um, another thing is just the existence of caches mean that uh, when you schedule processes on a multi-core, perhaps what you need to do is make sure that you schedule a process back on the same core it was running before to take advantage of the, um, take advantage of the caches on that processor. Um, if you have really large memory footprints, um, it's, it's possible that if you schedule too quickly, this is related to a question that was on last midterm, um, what happens is the, uh, you, um, schedule something, it runs for a little while, then you schedule something else, it's cache uh, gets kicked out again, you schedule it back. And because you're scheduling so quickly, you never get an ad the advantage of loading up the cache with all the state that's required to get good performance out of the process. Um, and of course, this is also uh, not just with processes, but deciding how to schedule uh, threads. Um, if you interleave too rapidly, you may degrade cache performance. And degraded cache performance, by the way, anytime you increase the number of misses, of course, the average memory access time goes up, as we mentioned. And then um, one of the other things is you need to often design operating systems data structures so that they tend to not uh, degrade with cache performance. And a great example of that, which is called false sharing, is 
if you have a data structure that's so big that it crosses a cache line um, and it's used by multiple processors, then even though the two of them uh, are using, well, actually, uh, even though the two of them are, are reading and writing that data structure, it may be bouncing around uh, between processors um, or uh, if you have a page that's being uh, only partially used by one or the other, it can be bounced around. So you have to really take advantage of your knowledge of what the cache looks like uh, to try to prevent cache lines that are being mostly used at a given time on one processor from being interrupted by something happening on another processor that may be uh, essentially unrelated. Um, so this is, uh, this is important uh, part of design, but we don't have, we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, the, uh, right now, what I'd like to talk about is sort of what TLB organization makes sense. So if you look at kind of the way we've been describing things here, is that the CPU um, talks to the, uh, produces virtual addresses, which basically give you a, uh, goes through the TLB, which then goes to the cache, which then goes to memory. And so what you can see from this very diagram here is that uh, if memory is DRAM and slow, and you've done a huge amount of work to make sure that something's in the cache, uh, then um, so that the CPU can do a fast load or store, the problem is that if you're not getting through the TLB really rapidly, then you've slowed everything down again. So you'd like your TLB to not get in the way of very fast access to the cache. Uh, and by the way, uh, I did want to say something more here. I uh, realize I uh, said something incorrectly. Um, there's sort of said two different things here, and I want to correct that. So false sharing is in particular a case where the cache line is a little bigger, but you have two little data structures that are on the same cache line. I'm sorry that I um, misspoke there. And basically what happens there is if processor A is using one part of it and processor B is using the other, the cache coherence protocol can be bouncing that cache line back and forth, even though those two processors aren't sharing that data at all. And so you have to be very careful about how things align on the cache, uh, on the cache lines. And that's called false sharing, where the coherence system thinks it's a share but the two processors aren't actually sharing information and everything gets slower. All right, so let's talk about now this TLB. How do we make this really fast? Because it's got to be kind of like it's half of a cache access or even faster than that. Um, and so it's in the critical path of, of memory access. So how the heck do we make this fast? Um, and thus, it's basically adding to the access time and reducing cache speed. Uh, and in some cases, if you do this poorly, the whole cycle time of the system gets slower and therefore your CPU is just plain slower. And this is kind of arguing somewhat that the TLB ought to be direct mapped or have very low associativity. Uh, however, uh, you have to have very few conflicts in order to make this not walk the cache a lot. And so that tends to argue for high uh, associativity or even direct mapped. Um, and so the question is, what are you gonna do? Um, pretty much that kind of argues that you, the TLB ought to have as high associativity as you can because the conflict misses are high, but to keep it fast, you'd make it small. And so if you're wondering why TLBs are often very small but have high associativity, it's really because they need to be fast and they need to avoid conflict misses. And those two things kind of go against each other. Okay. Um, and because the TLB tends to be a bit smaller, you can end up with thrashing situations, especially with modern operating systems. And modern operating systems like to have many address spaces, uh, one for each process. Um, we briefly mentioned microkernels at the beginning of the, the class. Um, in that situation, kind of the file system has a separate address space from um, the network stack, from um, the windowing system, et cetera, because those are all running at user level. And in that case, if your TLB is too small, you can actually get thrashing going on, where as you switch from process to process rapidly, uh, you keep kicking things out of the TLB. And so um, we got to be careful. Okay, and so you kind of want at least three-way associativity uh, here to sort of have a TLB entry for the code data in the stack. Um, you know, uh, and furthermore, kind of going with our previous question, what if the high order bits are the index? Well, what happens there is the TLB ends up being mostly unused for small programs, uh, 
because the, the uh, index at the top, you know, you don't vary much. So those high bits don't get changed much in a typical program. And so uh, putting the index bits at the high end basically means that you waste uh, whole chunks of your TLB. So we want to put the indexes low um, where they are kind of in our previous diagrams. So uh, how big does it actually have to be? Um, so it's usually small, 128, 512 entries. It's getting a little larger, but it's still pretty small. Um, and that way we can do higher sensitivity. Uh, we've got, um, they're usually organized, as I said, as a fully associative cache where the lookups by a virtual address and it gets back a physical address. And I'll show you that in uh, several sort of animations will help make that clearer. Um, what happens when the, the fully associative is too slow, then you can start uh, putting a very small, fast, direct mapped or low associativity mapped uh, TLB in front of a bigger direct map one, and that's called a TLB slice. So that's like a, having a second level cache. And here's an example of the MIPS R3000. So that's uh, a very, an old five uh, stage pipeline, kind of like the ones that they're returning to these days in 61C and so on. But I thought I'd bring this up just to show you. So each entry in the TLB has a virtual address that it's mapping, the physical address um, page that it's uh, maps to, and then a bunch of the access bits, and including an address space ID, which we're not going to talk about now. But you can imagine that what happens is um, the virtual address comes out, we extract the virtual page ID, we uh, fully associatively match it with one entry, say this one, what comes out is a physical address, which is then combined with the offset. Okay. So uh, here's an example of that pipeline. And the reason I'm, I went back to this one is because this was um, back in the days of simpler pipelines where uh, we could explicitly manage uh, our transistor is much better. And if you notice here, what happens is because we have a um, translation both for the instructions and for the data access, um, if you remember the five stages from 61C, that was the instruction fetch, the decode or register lookup, the ALU, the memory, and then the write, uh, write back to the registers. Um, and these are macro cycles, and then we actually have half cycles. And so what else, what happened in this processor was the instruction fetch, the TLB, would be looked up in the first half and then we'd have a whole cycle for looking up the instruction and at the end of that whole cycle which overlaps uh, the end of the instruction text cycle and the beginning of the decoding we'd look up in the register file which was often just half a cycle um, and then uh, the ALU if it was computing a memory address they try to do that in the first half of the cycle so that we could do the TLB lookup in the second and then we would have our uh, address for the memory cycle. So this is a situation where literally the TLB is in the direct path of uh, performance of the various caches. And so the TLB has to be very restricted in how long it takes. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a, a poor cache cycle time. All right. So um, are there any questions on that? So this is the simplest example of, uh, of a TLB integrated into a pipeline. I just wanted to show you this uh, so everybody could see. Are we good? Okay. All right. So then um, if you look, how do we get the translation time even further? Well, what we've talked to you about here is the CPU kind of puts the TLB in series with the cache itself. And so um, what we're really saying is the virtual page numbers pull out of the address. We look it up in the TLB. We get the physical page number. We merge the offset. And that's our physical address. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if we could overlap TLB lookup and cache lookup, all right? So I'm gonna show you a little magic now because that hopefully on the face of it should sound a little strange to you guys because what do we look up in the cache? We look this thing up, the physical address, okay? In this particular cache we're talking about. And so how can we do that? Well, if you look at a virtual address and you look at the physical address from the standpoint of the cache, there's this index and byte down below and only these parts of the address have to be used uh, to look up in the cache. This part is just the tag. And so if we can figure it out, if we can arrange so that the virtual address offset and the index byte portion of the cache take the same number of bits, then we can be uh, doing the cache fetch at the same time um, that we're doing the uh, lookup of the TLB with the virtual page number. And as a result, we can do them in parallel. 
Okay, so let me just show you how that might work here. So notice that uh, we take our um, address, we uh, do an associative lookup on the virtual page ID in parallel with grabbing the index, looking it up in the cache. We get our, our bytes back from the cache, including the tag. We do a comparison. And uh, by the time we get our tag, we've also finished our TLB lookup. And so those can happen in parallel. Um, now, don't worry too much about this. I'm just giving that as an interesting example to people who might find that curious. Um, but uh, you know, there are interesting questions. What if you want a, a bigger cache? Well, the problem is that a bigger cache direct mapped will uh, move the bits into this virtual page number. And so the trick with that is a bigger cache, you could have two 4K banks of an 8K cache. So if you increase the associativity, you can still do this in parallel. Or even if the index kind of moves into the virtual page ID, you can do uh, interesting things where you look up to part of the cache look up first and then wait for the address to come back. So, all right, I'm gonna leave that. That was for uh, you computer architects in the audience. So um, I, just a very quick, some examples. So. Um, 2003, this is the Pentium M TLBs. There are actually four different TLBs. Uh, the instruction uh, for 4K pages had a 128 entries, four-way set associative. Uh, for large pages, which you might use for the kernel, it actually had two entries fully associative. Um, and that would be mapping a small number of very large pages like you might have in the kernel. And the same for data. Um, and there's an LRU replacement policy. And you might say, why different TLBs for instruction data and sizes well the access patterns for the instructions and the data are a little different um, and there are different parts of the pipeline that we might be looking them up and uh, the page sizes are going to have different access patterns so uh, here's another one uh, the intel nahalem we actually had 64 entries uh, for 4k pages uh, and 32 entries for the big pages uh, the instruction tlb had 128 entries and 14 fully associative entries for the big pages. Um, and then there was a second level cache for TLBs that was unified between the two. Um, finally, this is an example of a very recent processor. If you look at this guy, um, it's actually, uh, you can see there's a TLB kind of uh, up here. Um, there's a TLB kind of in the middle. And then there's a unified TLB down below. And so we actually have, oh, here's the data one down here. So this is the data TLB. Um, the instruction TLB, data TLB, and the unified TLB. So these are actually uh, in a modern processor in this way. And if you look at the actual numbers, what's interesting about this is you can see, uh, for instance, that 128 entries, eight-way set associative, 64 entries, four-way set associative. And then the second level TLB has a lot of entries and is very associative. So even in these modern processors, these upper level things that are trying to be fast at cycle time are um, small, all right? And that's just, that's just because uh, we have to do that in order to make things fast. All right. So what happens on a context switch? So that's a question. Um, the address space just changed. So the TLB entries are no longer valid. So these entries, whatever they were, you know, the instruction and the data TLB, they're, they're mapping the address space for a given process. And so if we change processes, suddenly we got to do something because the TLB entries are incorrect. And so uh, what are our options here? One is you invalidate the TLB. Uh, so you could uh, basically reach out and mark every entry in the TLB as invalid. Um, that might be expensive, uh, but in a lot of processors, that's your only uh, option. Okay, because if you don't do that, you're going to get wrong translations. Um, a more modern option that showed up uh, starting about seven years ago in more frequency is that the TLB entries are also marked with a process ID uh, that's part of a context which you change the process ID. And as a result, when you change from process A to process B, process B's context or process ID is different. And so the TLB entries for process A are just ignored and they even stay in there if you don't kick them out. And so this is uh, nice because uh, you don't have to flush out your TLB. Um, however, if the translation tables change, um, in that case, uh, the hardware isn't gonna help you much. And so you really have to invalidate the TLB entries. Uh, and for instance, if you had a page that somebody thought was in memory, um, now you've got a problem uh, because it's no longer in memory. And so you might have to uh, 
change things. And that's called TLB consistency, as I mentioned earlier. You got to go out and bet, uh, flush the TLB. Okay, so let's put it all together. Here's our address. I got you a 10, 10, 12 uh, pattern. Here's our memory. If you look, page table pointer, okay, CR3, as I mentioned on the Intel, points at the first level page table. We grab our index that gives us a PTE uh, that points to a second level page table. We use our second level index, which gives us the final address. Physical page number started with, this is the virtual page number. This Everything in red up here gives us a physical page number. This is how many bits? This is 20 bits. This guy is also 20 bits when we're done. We merge the offset together. That points at a page in physical memory. Physical page points to a page in physical memory. And since this is uh, 20 bits, that means there are uh, two to the 20th or almost a, a, a little more than a million possible pages in physical memory that that could be mapping to. And uh, if you think about it, the offset is now gonna say what uh, byte or bytes in that page am I interested in? Okay. Now, of course, this is potentially slow. And so now let's talk about the TLB. So here we have a physical page number. And what happens with the TLB is we take these 20 bits, we fully associatively look it up, let's say in the TLB cache, that gives us the physical page, which we put in here and we've got a fast path, okay? And then finally, just because we can, let's throw the actual data cache in this. So the data cache, so this address, uh, this physical address, we, um, Think of it as having index in bytes and a tag, a byte address, index, and a tag. And so that index looks it up in the cache uh, and assuming that the tag matches, then the byte can be used to pick what byte you want. All right, so there you go. Those are all the caches that we've been talking about so far in this lecture. All right, any questions on that? All righty. Everybody good? Now, um, so if you remember, we had two critical issues going on in address translation. Uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, how do you translate the addresses quickly enough? And we've kind of, I think we've mostly put that to bed. The next one was, what do you do if the translation fails? Okay, and this is a page fault, all right? And we need to talk about what happens there. This is a synchronous exception. And uh, if you remember from the very beginning of class, I talked about uh, traps and, accept and interrupts, which are ways, sorry about that, I keep uh, pulling that guy down there, which are ways in which we go from uh, the user to the kernel. And um, there are actually traps and interrupts are separate things. So a synchronous exception or a trap is something that occurs because an instruction has hit a faulting point. Okay, this might be a divide by zero, or an illegal instruction, uh, or a bus error, whatever, bad address. Uh, those are synchronous because if you think about it, if it, you divide by zero uh, because of a divide instruction and you don't change anything and you try it again, it's always gonna happen at that same spot. So that's why it's a synchronous exception. Uh, a segmentation fault where it's an address totally out of range or a page fault uh, for illusion of infinite size memory, any of these things also cause synchronous exceptions because they're happening uh, in response to a load or store, all right? These synchronous exceptions can't be disabled like uh, interrupts, okay? Because if you were to try to disable them and you were to hit one, then what? The processor is basically unable to make forward progress and the best you could do, I guess, is just crash the whole processor. So uh, instead of that, basically synchronous exceptions or traps uh, are not disabled and you have to make sure that the operating system always knows how to handle uh, the current set of synchronous exceptions that might be possible. Interrupts are asynchronous. They occur kind of between instructions and not and could in, occur between any instruction if the right interrupts enabled. And so examples of this we've talked a lot about already this term are things like uh, timers and disk ready and network, etc. And interrupts can be disabled, okay? And that's uh, we've talked a lot about disabling them. Uh, in fact, certain interrupts can still be enabled when others are disabled. There's many options there. Um, but this, uh, so those are the two really key differences. Synchronous exceptions can't be disabled and happen synchronously with instructions. Asynchronous except, uh, exceptions can be disabled and uh, happen between instructions. Um, and on a system call, exception or interrupt, 
Uh, any of these cases that enter into the kernel, then of course we enter kernel mode with interrupts disabled um, because uh, even when you're entering with a synchronous exception, you're kind of in a fragile state there until you save enough registers. So all of these kind of disable interrupts, save the PC, and then jump to an appropriate handler, handler in the kernel. And the handler does any required state uh, preservation before um, in interrupts are re-enabled. So the reason I'm bringing this slide back up to you uh, again is because we're now talking about synchronous exceptions uh, for page faults. And to that end, we need to have a concept that uh, is, is important if you were to take one uh, or 252, either of those, but it's also very important for operating systems, which is the notion of a precise exception. And so we're now, we're, again, we're talking either uh, synchronous or interrupt, synchronous or asynchronous exceptions. And the idea of a precise exception is that when you enter the kernel, the state of the machine is exactly preserved as if the program executed all the way up to some one inf offending instruction. All the previous instructions are completed. The offending instruction and everything afterwards active if they have not even started. Okay. And what's good about this is that the, the system code, when it takes over, let's say because of the page fault, knows exactly what instruction uh, caused the exception and where to restart when it, uh, if it say paged the data back in. So having a precise exception is very important in order to really making page faults work. And it's very difficult in the presence of pipelining and out of order execution, uh, but modern computer architects have uh, figured out how to make that happen. Um, imprecise is basically anything that isn't precise, and uh, there have been processors that have a lot of different imprecise exceptions, and they're very messy. And usually, uh, in order to res restart an imprecise exception, the operating system has to do a huge amount of work. And uh, that huge amount of work is just something you don't want on a page fault, because you don't want to have to figure out where things fail, all right? And so, uh, performance goals may lead designers to go for imprecise exceptions, but uh, and, and often on mathematical things that couldn't be restarted anywhere anyway. But um, system software developers don't uh, like that because they have to figure out what to do about something like that. And so I will point out, just in case you're worried about this, that modern techniques for out of order execution and branch prediction pretty much fix this issue. So that uh, anytime you get an exception now uh, on a modern processor that does out of order execution and branch prediction, you just get a precise exception. So this is a big win for operating system folks like us because uh, we don't have to worry about thinking of the processor pipeline uh, and what might be going on in there at the time of the exception in order to restart a page fault. Okay, and architectural support is hard and so architects don't always get it right. And it's kind of funny, there are many examples of this. You're welcome to talk to me at other times. Like the original M6800, which was in a lot of uh, printers and stuff, had paging, but it didn't save the fault address properly, and you had to reconstruct a bunch of stuff in the operating system, very painful. Um, the original Sun workstations with the Spark processors had two, uh, two fault addresses that represented uh, the, the point of exception, and you had to re start the pipeline in a particular way to make that work properly. So that was always tricky as well. Um, so the page fault is a synchronous exception and it's a precise synchronous exception. So this is good. So what does that mean? It means the virtual to physical translations fail. Uh, the page table entry is marked as invalid for some reason. Maybe it's a privilege level violation. Maybe it's an access violation. These are all reasons that we could end up with a failed translation. And it causes a fault. And it's not an interrupt because it's uh, synchronous to the instruction execution. I hope I convinced you all of that. It might occur on instruction fetch or data access. And uh, protection violations typically terminate um, in a way that's restartable. Uh, and uh, you know that's because they're precise, so that's good. So then the page fault does what? Well, it enters a page fault handler, which engages the operating system in fixing. Uh, to try to retry the instruction. So it might, for instance, uh, allocate an additional stack page if we've uh, pushed the stack into an empty spot of the stack. Or maybe it makes the page accessible that we might use in copy on write after a fork. Or it might bring the page in from secondary storage, which is demand paging, pull it in off the disk. 
So protection violations that can't be resolved, what do you do? Well, you terminate the process. And um, oftentimes, this is where you get a core dump, um, which is a, uh, is a uh, terminology from ancient history when memory was uh, cores, um, little round lifesaver-like uh, round lifesaver like pieces of metal with a magnetic uh, one or zero. Okay, and so um, segmentation fault core dump exactly. Now um, fundamental inversion of hardware software boundaries kind of going on here. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a hardware instruction faults, and then the only way for that hardware instruction to make forward progress is if for the software to take over and do a bunch of stuff and restart that instruction. And so this is kind of an inversion. Usually you think hardware gets to do its thing and the software runs on top of it. Um, but here, this is a little different. Okay. And so, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, well, here's the good case, right? An instruction uh, has an instruction address that goes to the MMU, which translates, gets a page uh, number out of the page table, which uh, gives it a frame number. And then we take the offset and that lets us do the access. And so that instruction is running at full speed and everything's great. But let's try a different example. Instruction goes to the MMU, which goes to the page table, and there's no entry for this thing, at which point we get a page fault. The instruction is the precise ex exception point, and the page fault enters the kernel exception handler, and now we have a page fault handler. And assuming for a moment that the data we want is really on disk somewhere, then uh, what will happen is that page fault handler loads the page from the disk, updates the page table entry to point at it, uh, and then puts the task back on the scheduler on the ready queue, and sometime later the instructions retried. It tries it again, and it succeeds. Okay, and so this idea that um, the memory that's over here in the far right acts as a cache on a much bigger space in the disk is exactly what we think of in terms of paging. Okay, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about uh, next. And so we talked about this in uh, this uh, hardware software inversion where in order for the instruction to complete, it has to have intervention from the operating system, uh, which handles the page fault, and then restarts the instruction. All right, so demand paging, which I've just kind of shown you is a type of caching. So in that instance, in that, what do I mean by type of caching? Well, we found that something was missing and we pulled the data off of disk and put it into the memory. So in this instance, the memory is acting like a, a level of cache on top of the disk. Uh, so what, uh, what is that cache uh, in terms of its properties? So what's the block size? Well, the block size, rather than being 32 bytes, like we were talking about, is 4K because it's a page size. What's the organization? Is it direct map, set associative, fully associative? Well, if we do it right, it's actually any page can be placed anywhere in physical DRAM, and so it's fully associative. So the question is, can you have something in the cache that's not in the DRAM? Okay, so we, we need to be careful because the word cache is a very overloaded term and there are many caches, okay? And so in the many cache uh, view of the world, uh, basically this DRAM is a cache on top of the file system, even though there's also a SRAM cache on top of the DRAM. So there's multiple levels of cache. And that's actually that, um, multiple levels of, of caching I showed you earlier where I said we're trying to get the speed of the thing at the far uh, left, but the performance of the big things at the far right. Excuse me, the speed of the thing at the far left, but the size of the thing at the right. So, we, um, And so this is just part of that caching where now when I say caching, I'm talking about the DRAM as a cache on the disk. I hope that helps that question. So. Um, so this is actually a fully associative cache because we can put, in this instance, we just showed you here, when I pull this page off the disk and put it in DRAM, I can put it anywhere. So this, if DRAM is a cache on the disk, this DRAM is potentially fully associative. And the reason for that is that the TLB lets us translate any page frame number, any page number, uh, virtual page number into a physical page frame number. And because we can do any translation, this becomes a fully associative cache. All right, how do we locate a page? Well, we first look it up on the TLB, and then we do page tape, uh, table traversal if we need to, and that tells us what virtual address maps to physical addresses. Um, 
What is page replacement policy? Is it LRU, random, whatever? Well, uh, this is going to require a lot more explanation. We're going to get into, uh, into page replacement policies, including the clock algorithm next Tuesday. Um, but we really need to be as close to LRU as we can because the cost of going to disk is really expensive. And if we were physically in the same room, I'd say, how much expen how expensive? And you'd all yell, a million instructions worth of expensive, right? And so we're absolutely going to try to get as try to get our miss uh, rate on the this um, this particular cache as low as possible. Um, what happens on a miss? We have to go fill from disk. What happens on a write? Clearly, it's write through. When we write to this cache, we're going to write in the DRAM, and only if we replace something, then we have to write back to the disk. Okay. So here is that picture I showed you again. Um, and this is uh, going to that question about the cache. Notice that there are a bunch of caches um, on chip, second level caches off chip, there's DRAM and then there's disk and maybe even tape or SSD, whatever fits in between here. And so what we're trying to do is come up with something that has the speed of the things at the far left with the size of the things at the right. And that's how uh, we're gonna use caching. And so in this particular type of caching, which we call page paging or demand paging, is uh, attempting to do that where the main memory is a cache on top of disk. Okay, um, and so we talk about caching kind of on chip where the hardware manages the cache, paging uh, when the software is entirely managing this cache, deciding sort of what things are on disk and what aren't. Okay, so we'll pick that up next time. So in conclusion, uh, we talked again about principle of locality in all of our discussion all day today. Uh, temporal and spatial locality. Um, if you remember, the temporal locality is that if you use something, uh, you're likely to use it again um, soon. And if you, uh, spatial locality says that if you use something, you're likely to use something close to it. The way you get good spatial locality is you make larger cache blocks. And in fact, on the disk, we have a 4K size cache block. We talked about the three plus one major categories of cache miss, um, compulsory misses, conflict misses, capacity misses, and coherence misses. Um, and then we also talked about cache organizations, direct map, set associative, fully associative. I did notice that there's a comment on the, um, on the group chat about can you have something in a cache which is not in DRAM? There is a possibility to have what's a, a non-inclusive caching where um, things in the cache aren't necessarily in the lower levels of the cache, but that's usually for the SRAM only. Um, and finally, uh, we talked a lot about the TLB. Small number of PTEs and op optional uh, process IDs, typically fully or very close to as fully associative as you can afford from a timing standpoint. On a miss, you get a page table traversal and potentially a page fault. Um, and on a change in the page table, you might have to invalidate things. We talked about a precise exception, which is a precise exception point where all previous except, uh, instructions have completed and no following ones nor the actual instruction have started. And we can manage caches in hardware or software. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's it for today. And um, talk to all of your uh, folks in the class. Let's see. Next week, we're starting. Um, like I said, I have a little bit of a bet with uh, another faculty member or two who shall remain nameless that we can get our class uh, attendance way up to uh, the 50% rate. So let's see if we can do that. So if each of you talk to two of your friends or three of your friends, we could. Uh, we way over the top. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, and I hope you all have a great night. And we'll uh, see you on Tuesday. Ciao.